Yeah, yeah. 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 I'm enjoying this cloudy weather that we're having for the moment. I'll take it. Okay. Everyone ready for the ready for another weekend? It's coming, which is exciting. Uh, I wrote this up here just to remind you, don't forget that by tonight, right? By 11.59 p.m. this evening, that uh, first part of your paper is due, right? It's only worth 10 points. A lot of you have already turned it in. If you haven't, uh, make sure that you do this by this evening. Uh, so you're turning it in on Canvas under the instruction links, right? Uh, for this assignment, it's so with 10 points. All it should be is maybe like a paragraph or two, which character you're picking from which show uh, or movie and why. So give me a little bit of like a why you picked that person. And then you should have the citation information for your show on there, but it can be in any format, right? So who produced it, when was it produced, the name of the show, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but that is a kind of the first part here and you're again welcome to change this at any time so the sooner you commit to a character the the less work it is for you in the long run but are there any like lingering questions about this any uh anything you're confused about questions at all how many of you have a character in mind that you want to share your character yeah who you're thinking oh, maybe this is Oh my God. Okay. All right. I like it. Yeah, Jake, do you have one? Yeah. So what I'm actually be doing is I'm gonna be doing uh so I'm more into books than movies and shows. Sure. I'm doing uh Luke Castor from the Percy Jackson and the Movie series. Oh. Considering I've read these those books like a million times, sure. It's gonna make it easier to like, you know, diagnose. So that means I don't have to like read books, I can just go to like certain sections if I want to like find books or whatever and say like love it. Yeah, I'm gonna get to four a lot. No, I watch it like every week. That's like my daughter's favorite movie. Mind, I've watched it quite a few times. Yeah. Nice, Gaston. We'll talk about him later in the semester. Yeah, do you have a few? Okay. All right. I like it. Anybody else? Anyone over here? What are we? Uh, anyone have a character you're thinking? Yeah. What do you say that one again? Okay. Okay. Great. Great. Anybody else? I don't want Robbie your chance to share if you're excited to. Yeah. Batman. All right. I love it. Batman. All right. You could choose anyone. Okay. Animated, not animated, a movie, a TV show, even um, like I said, a video game or a book is fine. Uh, but somebody that you want to spend some more time thinking about, right? Uh, and again, if you start to dive into it a little bit and decide you want to change your mind, that's always fine. Uh, but don't forget to get that in tonight. If you miss the deadline, you can still email it to me. You lose 10% per day, which is only one point. But uh, better to email it to me tomorrow or like Friday or Monday um, than not turn it in at all. So that's okay as well. All right. Uh, anything else about that before we, before we move on? Yeah. Like probably a paragraph or two. It's, it's less than a page, right? And I'm not so much worried about formatting for this one as much as a just your character, why, and then all the citation information. All right, uh, so we'll go back to our anxiety disorders. We spent a lot of time last time talking about, uh, if I go back, generalized anxiety disorder, and then we talked about fear and phobias as well. Uh, and so the explanations, the treatments, what we'll talk about today, uh, we'll pick up with panic attacks and panic disorder and agoraphobia. We still have OCD and a few others to get through. Uh, panic attacks are another relatively common anxiety disorder. How many of you, either yourself or someone you know, has had a panic attack by show of hands? It's a lot of people. Anyone want to uh, describe like uh, anything about them and experience with one? Would it feel like any uh, stories or comments? Yeah. It's like you're having a heart attack, mm -hmm. but you're not. Yeah. And it happens for... In my case, it happens for no reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, like walking around doing my thing. And all of a sudden, I, I'm on my support, pulling at the mouth, thinking I'm going to die. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it can feel like you're going to die. And it can feel like a heart attack. 
And very common with these, they're brought on randomly, which makes them all the yeah. scarier for people because you they make them unpredictable. Other stories or comments or thoughts or anything for the moment about them, like experiences with them? You don't have to, but if you had one. Okay. Let's look at some of the criteria uh, for a panic attack. They tend to be relatively short lasting, but the aftermath of them can take some time. They can be exhausting. And so sometimes people take hours to days to recover from them. Um, and they can be an isolated incident, or it can be where you have recurrent ones, in which case you have panic disorder. So one attack would be an isolated um, occurrence, or it can be panic disorder where they're happening recurrently, and then you start to fear um, one happening again. So uh, for a panic attack, you have to have four or more of some of these following symptoms that I'm going to put up here that reach a peak within minutes. And typically, a panic attack is like 10 minutes or less most of the time for people. They, it happens very quickly. It comes out of nowhere. It reaches a peak, and then they tend to kind of go away. But again, you might be exhausted and feel like the aftermath of it for some time. But a lot of things are happening. You have heart palpitation. Your heart is racing, thumping. It can feel like a heart attack. It's really common for people who are having panic attacks to go to the emergency room thinking they're having a heart attack. And the more panicked you become about it, the more it kind of fuels the panic attack and the stronger it can become. So it's very common to feel like it is a heart attack. Um, there's a lot of sweating, trembling or shaking is pretty common. A lot of physical symptoms here, like it's just like the panic reaches a peak and like really expresses itself very intensely. Shortness of breath. Sometimes people feel like they're choking, right? Like they can't swallow, they can't breathe, like they're choking. Um, you get stuff like chest pain, nausea. Sometimes people will throw up or feel really sick to their stomach during a panic attack, feeling dizzy. Sometimes there's a sense of what's called derealization. The world around you sometimes feels very fuzzy. People sometimes get tunnel vision or feel like things are unreal in a sense, like that the things around you feel very blurry or unreal. Um, there's a, a fear of losing control. Sometimes even a fear of impending death. People oftentimes think this is something that's going to kill them. And again, it causes more panic and it just fuels the cycle. Um, chills and hot flashes. Are also relatively common with this. And then sometimes people get what's um, like, like a numbness or tingling. a lot of symptoms, a lot of like physical symptoms of anxiety and panic. And again, these are very intense occurrences. And what makes them so daunting is they're not brought on by anything specific. It's usually something that kind of happens out of the blue. And so when people have one, they oftentimes can develop like a fear of having them happen again. And so when they're ha happening recurrently, we call that panic disorder. And so common with this is something called agoraphobia. Agoraphobia is a fascinating fear. It has a lot of elements to it, but it's oftentimes we say panic disorder with or without agoraphobia. Because what you sometimes see with this is that people become so scared of having a panic attack that they won't leave their house. They don't want to be out in public and have a panic attack and not be able to get to somewhere where they feel safe or like a sense of security or safety. But agoraphobia also has this element of being afraid of being out in crowds, being afraid of being separated from a source of security, and, and an element of embarrassment and not being able to escape. It's got multiple prongs to it. I have a little bit of agoraphobia, just to be honest and share that with you. Uh, I will never sit in the middle of a row. 
right? Like if I go to a theater, like a movie theater, or even worse, like a, a performance, like where you're in a big theater, I would rather not go than sit in the middle of a row. You're not in the same for you. Yeah. And for me, it's like, I don't want that moment where I need to be able to get out and I can't, or I have to stand up and everyone's staring at me as I'm trying to get out of a row and like squeeze by everyone. So whenever we go to a show, I always sit on the end of a row. And my family knows this and they make fun of me for it, but whatever, I don't care. Um, we go to a restaurant, I have to sit on the end. If I'm in a classroom, I sit on an end or in the front where it's easy to get out. Um, and it's interesting with this, like that's part of it as well. It's like that moment of not wanting to be trapped or like embarrassed and not being able to escape. But it also can be like not being willing to leave your home um, or a source of security. Yeah. Yeah. That's so funny. But if it's brought on by something specific, it might be a phobia, right? Or like a PTSD occurrence. Uh, it's not impossible for it to have like kind of a more concrete, like specific cause, but they're usually kind of vague when you have habits. So like it's like a building of inside. So let's say you have a panic attack that was brought on by an exam, right? It might be a fear related to the exam more than uh, more than like a, like a traditional exam. But it can have triggers, like, and so sometimes people are able to identify their triggers, which helps a little bit with this. Uh, but they're typically more vague and kind of unpredictable in that way. A lot of you, uh, you know, said that you experienced this. Any other comments or stories about people in your life or yourself? Anything else with these? They can be, they can be a little bit difficult, right? Again, they're very intense, very short-lived, with or without agoraphobia, um, which is a very like multi-pronged. Uh, fear. Mm -hmm. A couple of things related to the causes and treatments for for these. They're very like thought to have a lot of biological stuff going on, right? They can be somewhat genetic, right? So panic attacks can kind of run in families, uh, but it's thought to be related to uh, a neurotransmitter called norepinephrine. And norepinephrine and the activities of like parts of the brain that control norepinephrine, like the locus ceruleus and a few others, uh, we often try to focus on that with medications. So you might see somebody taking like an SSRI or an SNRI, like an antidepressant to help with panic attacks. That's really common. Or like having like some of those things like Xanax and Valium that we talked about last time. There's a lot of medications that people can take to help them with anxiety. But a big part of this too is also the cognitive piece. Like when somebody's having a panic attack, uh, helping them to understand what's happening can reduce the panic, right? So if you think that it's a heart attack, you're gonna panic and like escalate it. Versus if you understand what's happening and you can kind of calm yourself down a little bit, that can go a long way. Anyone have things that you do to help you if you're having a panic attack, things that help you to calm down or help you to reset yeah i can just like just like start breathing those on breathing yeah those on things um, for me it was my sit in the room yeah okay so staying in your room focusing on your breathing to like calm down and distract yourself maybe anyone have anything else yeah counting, counting. yeah both of those are like very like mindfulness practices mm -hmm. where you're trying to take your mind off of it focus on something specific anybody else they have the like stereotype of breathing into a paper bag. The idea there is more focusing on your breathing than, than anything else, right? Uh, but with this, right, we're looking at somebody's like level of anxiety sensitivity, right? So it might be that they have like a more like hyper, like sensitive level of anxiety and learning to calm down, learning to understand what's going on in your body, learning techniques that distract you or, or help like take your mind off of it better coping skills, all of these things can be really, really helpful in helping someone to like pull themselves out of a, a panic attack. Or it might be that you need to stay home or take a nap, right? Like a lot of people need to recover from these. They can be a little bit uh, draining, as I mentioned before. Anything else with panic attacks before we move on from them? Before we talk about OCD, I want to talk about superstitions, right? We're going to talk about obsessive compulsive disorder next. And it's very, very rooted in superstitious thinking. 
Now, a lot of us have superstitions. There's nothing wrong with superstitions. Sometimes they are a little bit accurate. Right? But when you embrace superstitions to an extreme, it kind of segues into like obsessive compulsive disorder and like that realm. A superstition is a belief or practice surrounding like luck or prophecy or spiritual beings. It's this idea that like future events can be influenced or foretold by something unrelated, right? Like what a day keeps the doctor away? An apple, an apple a day, right? Step on one and break what? Right. Yeah, right. So when you're mad at your mom, every crack you can find, right? Step on. Uh, it's good luck to carry a rabbit's foot, right? Bad luck to walk under a ladder. Bad luck to break a mirror and black water. Bad luck. Yeah. I have two black cats. I'm screwed, right? No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, they're, they're fun. <laughs> but there's so many of these, right? Superstitious thinking is very much along the lines of OCD, right? Mm -hmm. But superstitions are common. What are some other, does anyone else have a, what are some other common superstitions that you might have? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> every single time under a tunnel yeah and now when i drive and go under a tunnel i hold my breath yeah like, even if i'm having a conversation i just have to hold my breath yeah right it's like a, a good luck thing um where you have a wish come true if you hold your breath in a tunnel what are some other ones anyone else have other superstitions that you know of or or in your life what do you yeah like i don't believe it but i still do it sure because it's like a habit yeah yeah crossing your fingers how many of you knock on wood, right? Like if something you go, oh, you better knock on wood. Uh, and all of these have really interesting like histories behind them. Knocking on wood, it was thought that spirits, good spirits, lived within trees. So if you knock on anything made from a tree, you're calling upon the fortune of good spirits to do these good fortune. So that's where the knocking on uh, on wood comes from. Anybody else? What are some other ones? There's so many. What are other? Anyone else have other superstitions? Yeah, Jake. Oh, I don't. I don't think this is much of a super. More of a routine thing, but I, I have like way too many people. It's like I switch every single every Sunday. I switch out what people I use. It's like I don't think that really. I'm not sure if that counts, but it's like I guess so it's more of a routine. Yeah, superstition. Yeah, I'm not sure it, it is a superstition, but it's definitely an interesting routine. Yeah, yeah. Um, at work, no one says like the sound because I'm right. Right, it's like when you're there. Oh, there's no traffic today. And then boom, there was the traffic. Right, like I kind of see this in that way. Yeah, yeah, that's a great example, right? Like if you say Macbeth in a theater, or you don't say good luck, right? You say break away instead, right? Anyone in here an athlete? Athletes are notoriously superstitious. Notoriously, right? Like can't wash that lucky sock or you're going to lose the game, or the lucky jock strap, which is just gross, right? But you don't want to lose the game, right? Uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, right, because you have to, right? If you don't, you're not going to win, or bad things are going to happen. Watch any, like, sports player, like, basketball players are notorious for this. Like, if you watch them do like a, a foul shot they always have their little routine that they have to do every time baseball players when they go up to bat right they always have like number of times they un like un velcro their glove or like swing the bat or step in and out of the box uh athletes are are, are very commonly known for this spilling salt right like what do you do if you spill salt you throw it over your shoulder right to blind the demons that are lurking behind you. That's why we do it as a side note. The number 13, we get a Friday the 13th in October this year, which is just way too fun for like any, if any of you are scary movie fans like I am. Uh, but the number 13, because Judas was the 13th guest at the Last Supper, 13, we don't have 13th floors in hotels half the time, right? You don't see that number used very often because it's like a, a superstition. There are tons of these and again there's nothing wrong with having superstitious beliefs but they can kind of segue us into things like ocd right obsessive compulsive disorder is an anxiety disorder where people have a lot of like superstitious thinking if i don't do x then y will happen or if i do x y will happen right and having this idea where you have like the the thoughts behind it leading to kind of rituals that you do to help get rid of the anxiety. And OCD is very, very common. 
and very commonly confused with something called OCPD, obsessive compulsive personality disorder, which we'll talk about more um, later in the semester. But what you see with this is people have disturbing anxiety thoughts, and then they perform a ritual to make themselves feel better. Um, I have a video that I wanna play you of a young mom who struggles with this, and then we can talk about some of the symptoms of it. Um, and so she kind of has, a, I think, an obsession around contamination, right, with germs, which is very, very common, especially more so now um, than ever. But let me play this for you, um, treating her, which I think is really interesting as a follow-up. But you can see her uh, obsessions and compulsions that she's doing. Now, the obsessions are the thoughts, okay? The obsessions are the disturbing thoughts or images or impulses that occur in somebody's head versus the compulsions are the behaviors. And the criteria to have this disorder, there's only two. Um, you have obsessions and compulsions, right, which are up here, and they are time consuming, at least an hour per day on average. Now, for a lot of people, this can be quite a bit more, okay? So what we see is that you're having these obsessive thoughts that occur in your mind, and then you perform these like ritualistic compulsions to get rid of the anxiety. Now, with her, the obsessive thoughts were contamination, right? Like she's worried that something's going to be contaminating her, and her compulsion is to wash her hands according to some rule over and over and over again, right? Or that someone's going to do something to her son, so you see her spinning around in circles. Sometimes people have obsessions around uh, checking behaviors, like I forgot to turn something off or I forgot to lock something, and then the compulsion will be going to check it or locking something repeatedly. And we all do a little bit of this, like a little bit of this is totally normal. Like every single night before I go to bed, I double check that I've locked the front door, right? That, that's just like a normal routine that I have. And I would say it's not even abnormal to go to my front door and like maybe I lock it and unlock it once just to make sure it's actually locked. Still within the realm of normal. Maybe I go to bed and I forget and I go check it one more time. Like again, it's still not too bad. But if you're laying in bed and you can't sleep because you're so worried you didn't lock that front door, or you start locking it and unlocking it like five, six, seven, eight times to make sure it's locked, then you're starting to transition into like another zone like this. So some degree of this is pretty common, uh, but it gets kind of out of hand for people who have OCD. It takes up a lot of time and energy. It causes problems. I actually, uh, it was really interesting. I had a student four years ago, it was before COVID, so like four years ago, and she was in this class and she would get up and leave during class like multiple times. And I never knew what it was about, right, for like the longest time. And I wasn't going to ask her. I didn't want to embarrass her. But she would get up and leave for like eight, 10 minutes and then come back. And it was enough that like I noticed it after like a week or two, like because it was happening every time. And after this lecture, she came up and she's, she's like, I was wondering if you ever noticed that I leave during class. I was like, yes, I have noticed. Like, are you going to tell me why? Like, I was so curious, but I wasn't going to ask her about it. And she's like, I have OCD. Um, and I'm always afraid I didn't lock my car. And I'm like, so you're leaving to check your car three times a class. And she's like, yeah, I run all the way down past the academic center building, check my car and come back. I was like, wow, you must be in great shape to do that three times, like three times just during that hour and 15 minute class. And she's like, yeah, that's why I'm all sweaty when I come back. And I was like, well, I was, again, I wasn't going to ask her. Um, and she's like, it, it causes me so much difficulty, but I can't let it go. I'm so worried that I didn't lock my car. I go down there, I check my car, I lock it and unlock it a couple of times and then come back. And then 20 minutes later, I can't shake it and I go do it again. I was like, you realize by telling me this, I'm not going to let you go now to do this. And she was all like, no, like you, you got to let me go like to do it. Like you could see the anxiety all over her face. And then she didn't show up for class the next session. And I felt so guilty. Like that was all my bad. But then she showed up after that and she sat there the whole class and didn't leave. And she would like, I could see the anxiety on her face. And she came up to me afterwards. She's like, I didn't leave. I was afraid you'd say something if I did. I'm like, I want to, right? And she's like, so I, did, I, I didn't do it. I didn't leave. I'm going to go now, though, and check, right? Like, and, like, she never left again during class, like, which I viewed as progress. Like, she probably caused her a lot of anxiety. But that's so common with this. It's like, I maybe I didn't lock my car. I got to go check it. 
Maybe I didn't turn off the coffee pot. Better check it, right? I got to lock the door five times and unlock it five times in order to make sure that it's actually locked or wash my hands according to some certain rule. It takes up time and it interferes with your life in, in some way. Any um, any of you with OCD or people in your life with this? Any stories or comments or thoughts or anything yet? Um, for me, when I was younger, I didn't, I was afraid that someone would come up in the middle of the night and rob our house. Okay. So so a lot of times when I go to sleep, if I you have a light comes on automatically outside of our out of our house, whoever I turn on, I panic and go to check it. Okay. And that happened for like probably a few few years since I've been growing out of it. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and that might be more of like a phobia, actually. Maybe. But the checking behavior is kind of similar yeah. to this for sure, right? Yeah. Uh, my grandma's sister is now passed, but she had extreme OCD and she had this um, fear of contamination. But yeah. at first, it was specifically from her mom. And her mom's family, like she wouldn't let them touch her. And when she moved out with her partner, she like moved to a different state and said, You can't come in this state because my state is oh, I... contaminated. <laughs> yeah. And when she would visit my grandma, she had to first, her partner would go with her to a hotel and they would put towels down to walk there. And she would shower, change clothes there, then go to my grandma's house. Wow. And then she had to go back to the hotel shower and change clothes and her partner would have to lay towels down for her to walk on so that she wouldn't get contaminated while she was in that state with my grandma. Wow. Okay. It's a lot, right? And so that's pretty profound. Yeah. Like OCD, right? And what's interesting is that the contamination fears have gone through the roof over the last like three years, as you can imagine, right? With like COVID. And and some of it was for good reason. And then like then some people went way too extreme with it, right? Like my um I like don't let people wear shoes in my house anymore because of COVID. Like we all take off our shoes now and and like everyone washes their hands, like and, and like just different routines. But like I have people in my life who went so wild with their compulsions and behaviors around contamination during COVID that you couldn't even see them because of. Um, and so it's interesting as a culture, we see more of this related to contamination because of things like like COVID. Yeah. You can develop it. You can be born with it, but you can also develop it later for sure. You can learn this um, as much as you can be like being focused with that thing about this. There's a lot of correlation between eating disorders and OCD. Um, and because both of them have a lot to do with control and trying to control what you think. Um, and so it's not uncommon for someone who has an eating disorder to also have OCD or vice versa. Like they can occur together, but we see a, a little bit of comorbidity. Is that a there's one button? Yeah. Yeah. I was gonna say my mom has OCD. Yeah. So after COVID, it was like awful. Because already, like in high school, when I would come home, there was a step. I'd okay. come in the house. I can't really step in the main floor. So I'd come through the garage. I'd have to take off my shoes, change my clothes. I had to clean my phone. Okay. So I couldn't bring my phone in the house because, like, I can't eat. Uh -huh. um, and I would have to have, like, a change of clothes. So I would bring my school clothes in. Sure. And the backpack would have to, I think it's pretty common, though, and stay anywhere on the floor. You can put it on any tables, like any chairs, and uh -huh. be on the floor because it was often family. Sure. Yeah. And was it like that before COVID, or was that more of like a, a induced by COVID? Um, it was like that before. Yeah. And after, it was more reasonable. Okay. With COVID yeah. rises. Yeah, it makes it feel reasonable when there's an actual something out there that's threatening, right? But... So I was like, how do I live? Yeah. <laughs> like, 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 I would be really not develop like sure. OCD. Like, because I was like, I don't know what's normal. Like, what do you normally like do? Mm -hmm. But like, you normally come to the house and shoes. Do you like sit on your bed with like the same clothes you went out with? I was like, I don't know what's like normal. And not I love that you said that. Because it's different for everybody. Like everybody has a different, like, norm, right? And it can be really difficult. That's how we pick up disorders. Like you said, like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. You tend to imitate what you know, right? And so then you have to make your own rules for how you, like, handle it for you, right? And, and that's something we have to do with.
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's common, right? I mean, because you're trying to, like, that was normal in your house, right? And so it becomes normal to you in a way. And then you have to decide, you know, what rules you're going to make for yourself. And it's tricky because that's a big part of mental illness. Like, sometimes we learn them from the people in our lives. So they can be very, like, behavioral like modeling you watched this for all those years and so you tend to kind of pick it up yourself as well um and i i don't know like we have a lot of people in our life that we kind of make fun of for like their compulsions related to contamination but it became grounded when covid hit um and so it's it's interesting it's really uh some some potential causes uh freud proposed that ocd comes from potty training like toilet training as a child now, there isn't a lot of support for this, but it was a very popular theory for a lot of years. So Freud said that when we're learning to um, use the bathroom for the first time when we're not and get out of a diaper, that we're learning control over our bodies, right? And so if you're really harsh or strict or punitive when a child is toilet training, they become anal retentive. In his case, he meant literally holding on to your feces and urine as a control thing. But we see that people who are very anal retentive have to have things be a certain way. And there's some correlations with OCD. Now, uh, again, not a lot of support, but it was a very prominent idea for years. From a behavioral standpoint, we're much more concerned with the compulsions, right? Behaviorists look at the behaviors that you do, which is the compulsion piece. And so there's a very common um, treatment from a behavioral standpoint called exposure and response prevention. You expose somebody to the thing that causes them anxiety, but you don't let them do the thing that would make them feel better. They don't let them perform the compulsion. So like with Stephanie, the mom that we just watched, she is exposed to germs and then not allowed to walk her hands. So my student, not allowed to leave to go check her car, right? And it causes people anxiety. They cry, they're upset, but you have to break that cycle. There's a lot of conditioning with this. It's the thought that like, well, every time I do this, nothing bad happens. Well, let's show you that like, even if you don't do it, nothing bad will happen either. Now, if something bad does happen, that makes it very difficult to break, right? I keep working on it. But this is a common treatment. You expose somebody to something that causes them anxiety, but you don't let them do the behaviors that would make them feel better, right? I want to show you what this looks like with that same mother. Um, they have a therapist come in and help her work on exposure and response prevention. And it's really successful for her. It takes a little bit of time and it's very difficult at first, but it can be incredibly successful if somebody does it. Let me show you the other half of that. Good. Second. Okay. Contamination has colonized every aspect of the He looks so happy right at the end, like her little son, just like picking stuff up and running around. So nine sessions um, and that um, gets her there. That's exposure and response prevention, right? Rather than letting her wash her hands or avoid that, she faces it head on and you see her crying, you see her upset. It's difficult for her to do, but you face that fear and you learn that like what has been holding you up is kind of the avoidance of it. And that's a big part of treatment for this is, is really trying to break that cycle of, of whatever behaviors you're doing to stop the anxiety. So that's a huge, huge focus of the treatment for, for OCD. Um, oops, sorry, I skipped a slide. There's also cognitive and biological elements though. And like with any other disorder, we can use all of these together depending on the, on the person. But you look at the thoughts, like what are some of the thoughts that are going on in this person's head, right? Uh, people's blame themselves, right? Expecting that terrible things will happen, those superstitious kind of uh, mentalities. So we try and focus on what are some of the thoughts that you're having? Are they grounded in reality? What's the worst that could happen? What's the most likely thing that could happen? And trying to kind of tackle it from a cognitive perspective. And then we can obviously give people medication as well. Low levels of serotonin are thought to be a big culprit 
in things like OCD. So people will take antidepressants or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, things that focus on serotonin, uh, to try and increase the activity level of serotonin in the brain. Uh, there are a lot of regions of the brain that control serotonin. And so we might give someone a medication, we might work on some cognitive elements, some behavioral elements. Usually, right, depending on the person, we kind of attack it from like multiple angles. And so it might be that someone's in therapy working on the thoughts and the behaviors while also taking a medication that's going to help to increase serotonin and give them a chance to kind of tackle it in both, both ways. So very, very common um, anxiety disorder. A lot of people struggle with like OCD-like thinking or beliefs. And, uh, and these are some of the common treatments. Any other like thoughts or questions? Anything else about OCD before we talk about some OCD related disorders? But okay. there are a couple of disorders that are very connected to OCD. So we call them OCD or obsessive compulsive related disorders. They share some elements with OCD but they're a little bit different. Uh, and it's interesting because some of these like body dysmorphic disorder was moved in the last DSM. It used to be somewhere else entirely, but you can see some of the elements that are present here. Uh, so hoarding, trictotillomania, which is probably the most fun disorder name to say, uh, excoriation and then body dysmorphic disorder. So all of these are very similar. They share elements with OCD. Hoarding, uh, hoarding disorder, uh, we commonly call this person like a pack rat. <laughs> hoarding is when you hold on to things or you have an inability to let go of things, even if they're worthless or maybe even hazardous or unsanitary. People who are hoarders oftentimes have way too much stuff and they really struggle to get rid of it. I have a neighbor down my street who's a hoarder and it like spills out of their garage. It's all in the driveway, all on the sides of the house. There's just stuff everywhere. And it's very common with this disorder. It's hard to get rid of stuff because I can't throw away that water bottle that represents the time that we shared together today in this class. So I'm gonna hold on to it in case I need it later. Can't get rid of those magazines because what if I need them later, right? Oh, I'm gonna pick up this item that someone left on the street because it could be like useful for me at some point where I'm gonna spend all this money and have all these acquisitions and items, uh, but never open them or take them out of the packages. But it can reach a point where people are unable to live in their houses or they have so much like filth and buildup of stuff uh, because they are unable to let it go. Yeah, Jake. So I think, I believe, I think I'm a different word because I have this five terabyte partner with my, which I really love. First of all, the Volume link was literally labeled huge archives, and I only have a few hundred gigabytes left on that drive. And most of it is just random stuff I've downloaded from the, like, for example, I've downloaded 500 gigabytes of data from a German FTP server. Most of it I've made a use for. I also downloaded uh, 2.8 terabytes from an MSDN archive. I, have, I basically have downloaded a bunch of stuff that I, a lot of it is stuff I don't really need, but it's just sitting on this drive. Sure. I never know when I'll need it. So I'm not sure if it's archiving or <laughs> digital recording or like, like where that kind of falls, but thankfully, I mean, a hard drive, like a an external hard drive, doesn't yeah. take up a lot of space, so it probably doesn't yeah. interfere with your life in any way. No, so no. You're, you're okay. Yeah. But like, let's say you take that and it wasn't digital stuff; it was physical. Well, stuff, that would be bad. Right, and then it might get in the way and cause you problems. Right. So yeah. remember, with every disorder, we all have elements, but it has to cause that clinically significant distress and impairment and affect your life to cross. Yeah. yeah. My grandma has like cats part uh parts of room in the house. Yeah. But just stuff on the sides and like there's no words they can't go in at all. Yeah. Because like there's like a foot, maybe even like more than a foot of like, stuff. Of stuff. Yeah. I can do the tire. Yeah, and having cats through the stuff is like a telltale sign, right? Like like a, a boarding and it's really common in older generations, like people who lived through the depression and periods of poverty have a, you know, traditionally have more of a, like, I got to hold on to the mentality. Uh, it's really interesting that you see high correlations there. Anyone else? Any stories or thoughts here? Yeah. So all these disorders have to do with uh, sense of control. 
Yeah, a lot of it is control or inability to like let go of something or like there's a thought behind it, right? If I let go of this item, something bad will happen or I'll need it later. So you get these like it's similar to OCD in that in that way. But a lot of control related things are trying to grasp for control that you don't feel. Yeah. Um, it's it's not exactly like right, but I think it's kind of funny. It's we always joke that my mom's like the opposite of a hoarder. Okay. She throws everything away. Yeah. Even if it's sentimental. Like I've joked with her, I'm like, yeah, you probably even threw away like my first shoes and like my baby blankets, because she holds like no <laughs> sentimental value on that. Interesting. And she's very much like if it has no use to me at this moment in time, get rid of it. Mm -hmm. And I'm like the opposite. Like I have sentimental, uh, like fine sentimental value in sure. objects. And so does my dad. And my dad loves computer stuff. So he's got like all these cords. He's got cords from like 30 years ago that probably don't even work. And my mom just like looks at the drawer and she just eyes it all the time. She's like, <laughs> I just want to throw it away. I want to throw it all away. Like, Please get rid of this. And I was like, no, like I might need it. And she's like, <laughs> it's awful that's funny and sometimes you get that where one person throws everything away and one holds on to everything and it can cause you know interesting dynamics there yeah. right and yeah I mean not a disorder but it's the interesting opposite right of like I don't hold on to anything yeah. right? any other thoughts or stories or comments or anything hoarding lots of uh really disturbing shows to watch on hoarding like on tv but uh it's a very like common thing it started out again like being a pack rat you hold on to everything but you have a hard time letting go of it these two are very similar trichotillomania and excoriation have similar roots just different ways of manifesting them so trichotillomania is when somebody pulls their hair out right now this could be hair on your arm it could be hair on your head hair on a part of your body uh eyelashes, eyebrows, right? It can be anything, right? And it's often exceedingly mindless. People don't realize that they're doing it. Like a lot of us have little like ticks or things that we do that we're not always aware of. But what happens is people end up with big bald spots on their arms, on their heads, on, on wherever. Uh, my daughter, Emma, uh, my, my, most, my most interesting child, I want to say, uh, Emma used to pull her eyelashes out. Like, I just absolutely didn't even realize she was doing it. Like, when she was bored or stressed, she would yank on them and have no eyebrows and no eyelashes, right? And um, it was uh, the response to anxiety, right? And that's what you often see with this is people are doing it as, like, an anxiety response, but they may or may not be aware they're doing it. Same thing with excoriation, skin picking disorder. People will pick at scabs or sores um, on their body and they'll end up with infections and like open wounds everywhere. It's really common to see. Like if you see somebody who has like a whole leg full of like scabs and open wounds, they might be picking at things mindlessly. And so both of these are thought to be like coping mechanisms for anxiety, right? You're almost doing it mindlessly in a way. And, and then this one is very different. Like whether it belongs here or not is kind of up for debate, but body dysmorphic disorder is where people have uh, like obsessive thoughts about their appearance. And then they oftentimes make a lot of actions to deal with it. So maybe have multiple surgeries to deal with like un uh, unhappy with their nose. So they have multiple procedures on it or multiple makeup procedures or um, whatever it might be. It could be a smell that they think that they have or like something in the way that they look. They feel like part of themselves is like grotesque or unattractive or ugly and everyone's staring at it. And so then they perform a lot of procedures to try and make it better. I have a clip of this that um, I'll play for you. It was from like a Dr. Phil episode. But this uh, this woman has BDD and she doesn't leave her house because she's so convinced everyone's staring at her because she's grotesque. She's a very like, a, like typical looking individual. But that's a, an oftentimes an element that you see with this is that people think there's something really disturbing about them uh, when, you know, that's not actually the case. Imagine. Look twice, like there's nothing abnormal at all, but in her mind, right, there's something like grotesque about the way she appears, right? And that's very common with that disorder that people will, you know, go out procedure after procedure to fix things that they see as defective, even though there's maybe nothing outwardly that like stands out in any way. Yeah. This disorder also. I love that you asked that. Okay. So body dysmorphic disorder and eating disorders have a lot in common. It's one of the criteria for this, that it cannot exclusively be due to weight. If it's only about your weight and like your size or maybe your stomach due to weight, 
then it falls into the eating disorder category. Because there's a lot of it, similarities, right? Like people will obsess about their weight being like too much or not enough or whatever. If it's only related to weight, it falls as an eating disorder. If it's anything other than that, it would fall fall here, right? And uh, you see that with a few disorders right, where they have like an exclusionary criteria. So with this one, it could be a nose. It could be part of your like face, your body. Like I said, it could be your body odor or like the size of like your foot or your toes, right? It could be anything, right? But you obsess about it to the point where you feel it's defective and you oftentimes undergo lots of procedures to fix it. It's very OCD-like, right? You have these thoughts and then you perform behaviors to try and make it better. There's a really rare but interesting, like fascinating uh, like side disorder that can sometimes come um, related to this called body integrity identity disorder or B. IID. It used to be known as amputee identity disorder. This is like the extreme version of this, where people feel like part of their body is not their own and they want to amputate it. Right now, it's really rare, but it definitely happens where people will be like, This is not my hand. I want this removed. It's not mine. It feels foreign to me. It's not part of, of my like identity. It's not part of my body. And I want to physically remove it. Now, there have even been cases where people have gone as far as to chop off their limbs because they feel like it's not part of their body, right? Uh, so really like rare, but it is like the extreme offshoot of this body integrity identity disorder um, or amputee identity disorder as it used to be called. Again, not common, but it would be like the extreme version of that. Any uh, other thoughts or questions, stories, comments, anything here? Yeah. It, it's almost like the opposite of it, right? So um, phantom limb is when somebody like, let's say you have part of your body amputated for some reason, like a leg, um, and then you still feel like that leg is there. Um, and that's because you have all those nerve endings that were there all that time. Your brain has like processed that information. And so it can sometimes continue to process it even when that part of your body isn't there. But it's more like, oh, this leg isn't mine. I want to remove it. And then you might actually still have like phantom limb pain once you've removed that part of your body. Yeah. So in, in this case, for the that disorder, would we know like a causation for this disorder? Or is there like yeah. a causation between like confessions that leads to some, this type of disorder? Uh, with, with this one or with this one? Uh, with the, the, the Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's thought that it's almost like a delusion in a way. We'll talk about delusions with schizophrenia, but it's a, a false belief in reality. It's like, it's like an extreme form of dissociation, right? Where you literally feel like that part doesn't belong to you. And it's often not grounded in like the most like concrete, like realistic thinking, right? There's usually something kind of bizarre about the thoughts behind it, almost schizophrenia like in a sense. Um, it's like an extreme delusional form of, of thinking, but people can believe it so firmly that they're willing to like literally cut something off in pursuit of feeling better and sometimes will feel better once they've removed that limb. So it's wild. It's very rare, but it's, 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 it's out there. Yeah. They just had an episode. Uh, I don't know if you watched Chicago Men. Mm -hmm. My mom was watching it, and there's a psychiatrist on there, so there's a lot of psych disorders that get brought up. Nice. I just watched um, one of the like last episodes of the recent season. They had a guy that had this disorder, yeah, and like claimed to be paralyzed and so could be in a wheelchair because he believed his legs weren't part of his body. Wow. And then to the point where like he came in, like, dude, you're not paralyzed, and then there's actually a problem with his legs. And they're like, if you don't operate, you'll lose your legs. And he's like, I don't want the surgery then. I want to lose my legs. Wow. And it was like this whole issue. But then because like there was nothing else, like everything else was sound with logic and stuff, uh -huh. they actually didn't perform the surgery because they couldn't. Because that's what he of, wanted. He was sound yeah. in mind and he decided to deny yeah. medical things. So then he ended up just losing his legs, which was what he wanted anyway. And then it like, made him feel better fascinating right and that's that's exactly that yeah and it, there's a lot of ethical issues with it because it's your body right and so like he was sound enough of mind to say i don't want the surgery and so you can't do anything you can't force the surgery yeah but there are times where people will go to a therapist you know they'll go to a doctor and they'll be like i want my foot amputated it's not my foot now uh, the doctor's not going to be like okay you know just take it off right yeah. there's a lot of like psychological things that that person has to go through 
But then you run into the issue of like, well, it's their body. It should be their choice. But are they sound enough of mind to make that choice? Like well, it gets complicated. Like, yeah, right. But then at the same time, yeah, they're inflicting harm on their own body. Right. Yeah, it's messy. It gets really complicated. The ethical issues sometimes with these things um, can get very tricky. Yeah. Right? Where do you draw the line? All right. That is our last uh, anxiety disorder slide. So what we'll do next time when I see you on Monday, um, Monday, we will look at stress and trauma disorders, which is chapter five. So disorders related to stress and different like traumatic events, like a PTSD, dissociative identity disorder, and some really interesting ones. Uh, don't forget about the first part of the paper due by this evening. Uh, make sure you turn that in on Canvas. Have a wonderful weekend, and I will see you all on Monday. Good day. You too. Thank you. Thank you.